All right, gang, today is our last installment of Politics in the 19th Century Europe. <clears throat> um, and today we're going to look and take a look at um, a unified Germany and how Germany um, became known as Germany and, and stopped being known as Russia or Prussia and became united. So first of all, first thing we got to wrap a brain around uh, that is uh, really important here is that Prussia equals Germany in this case. Okay. Whenever I say Prussia, I basically want you to think about Germany. Okay. And that's because Prussia leads the push for German unification. Okay. Um, Prussia becomes the country, the, the portion of northern what we'll call today Germany and, and part of Poland. Prussia leads the push for German unification, and they're the ones that unify um, them. Well, they had some help from Napoleon. Historically speaking, um, Napoleon, that's Napoleon I, had, just like he did in Italy, he had united people together <clears throat> based on a common culture. And people began to like that. He also infused them with some liberal ideas, essentially the idea that we are all equal before the eyes of the law. And he also allowed them um, certain rights um, to people as well. And, and so while they were ruled by a Frenchman and, and his French family, they were united together with a similar and common culture. And so that helped encourage a sense of nationalism. And that idea sparked the, the very nascent or very infant, very beginning of nationalist feelings. Second thing you need to understand about German unification is that is it is a story of Prussia versus Austria. Austria initially was the strongest German state, the strongest country that spoke German. But the problem with Austria was that the southeastern portion of the Austrian Empire was made up of a bunch of tiny little countries that were different ethnically. Okay, not necessarily countries, but they were they had a ton or a wide variety of ethnic groups. <clears throat> and that made it really difficult for them to all unite together, whereas Central Europe and, and um, Northern Europe is predominantly Germanic. While they are different, they're not as radically different as the people in the Austrian Empire. Okay, well, um, the very beginning of the German unification begins with something called the Zollverein. Uh, the Zollverein is a tax union or a tariff union, and essentially their job is to lower taxes or tariffs um, on goods traded between them. So as we go to the map on the next page, what you're going to notice is that um, the northern portions, although there were lots of little different countries that were made up what were called Germany, um, they had tariffs between them. And remember, a tariff is a tax on imports. And those taxes on imports really hurt a group of people called Junkers. Okay, Junkers were farmers. Okay, they're big <clears throat> land-owning aristocrats, and these Junkers, looks like Junkers, had a lot of money, okay, and the, those Junkers had a lot of money, and they grew a lot of crops, and so they wanted to be able to sell their goods between the states, between the little German country, freely, and by lowering or eliminating tariffs, that really benefited them. Well, in <clears throat> 1848 was the first attempt at German unification, and it completely and totally failed. Initially, they said, yes, we're all going to be united, um, but that didn't work out. And the reason that it didn't work out was because they um, it was done through agreements and through uh, pieces of paper saying, yes, we'll all unite together. Well, they had nothing to actually bind them together other than those agreements. Well, in 1860, uh, the Frederick William died. He was the king of Prussia. And Frederick William died. And ascending to the throne or coming to the throne is his son William. You need to know that name, William the First of Germany. And William the First of Germany appointed in his second year on the throne probably my favorite person in all of history. My favorite person in all of history is a guy named Otto von Bismarck. Now, Otto von Bismarck became his prime minister. And what that meant is that he was the head of the government, basically, and that he ran the government for the for the uh, emperor or for the for the king, um, and so Bismarck was a great guy. Um, if you like German history and you like people that are kind of sneaky, okay. So here's one example, um, or here's a speech that he gave. He gave this famous speech, and he said, "German unification will not be achieved through speeches and proclamations, but through blood and iron." Now, this is a stereotypical German attitude toward things. He wants to be very forceful in what he's doing, and he wants to almost force other people into following him. Um, and he doesn't do it forcefully, but what he does is he does follow something called realpolitik. Realpolitik is the politics of reality. Um, essentially, realpolitik means that whatever I need to do in order to reach my end goal, that's what I'm going to do. Okay, I'm going to operate 
realistically. If I need to wage war on someone to get this land that I want, we'll wage war. If I can do it through agreements and signing treaties, we'll do it for, through agreements and signing treaties. But whatever it takes, that's what we're going to do to get land. And that was his number one goal, was unifying Germany. <clears throat> So here we see the uh, northern part of here. The tariff union are all these countries eventually. The Zollverein were the ones here in the north. And also, if you look at this map, you can see the dates that they all united with Prussia and became what's called the Northern uh, German uh, Confederation. Um, anyway, so now Germany earned its unity through war. Okay, Italy took a very different path through their unification. But Germany issued theirs or gained theirs through war. The first of these war was the Danish War. And the Danish War took place in 1864. The Danish War took place here with, obviously, with Denmark. And the Danish War was Prussia and Austria, and that's important, Prussia and Austria, fighting against Denmark. And what they gained out of defeating Denmark were these two little areas right here, uh, Schleswig and Holstein. If you know what a Holstein cow is, that's where Holstein cows come from. Holstein cows are black and white cows that are generally uh, milk cows. Um, so that's the area of the world where they originate. Well, so in the Danish War, Austria and Prussia worked together. So they gained this little land here. So uh, Bismarck is like, all right, yeah, we're good to go. Now, the second war is called the Seven Weeks War. And what happened in the Seven Weeks War, which took place two years later in 1866, in the Seven Weeks War, um, Bismarck uh, created a conflict, basically. He, he created some sort of uh, conflict between Schleswig and Holstein. Holstein was run by Austria, and Schleswig was run by um, Prussia. And so he created this conflict. Uh, he basically made them fight each other. And Austria had to come to the support of uh, Holstein, and Prussia said, no, you're not going to support them. And before Austria could act, Prussia made the first modern use of railways in Europe to move troops quickly to a place and attack. And so within seven weeks, the Prussians right here, had defeated the Austrians, and Austria would basically not be an issue in world history until World War I. So they are squashed. They are down below Prussia in terms of standard. Well, <clears throat> with the um, with the Franco, I'm sorry, with the Seven Weeks War, um, what was gained out of the Seven Weeks War was this northern portion right here. We're finally all part of the Northern German Confederation and part of under the control of Prussia. Well, happening next, um, they still didn't have this southern portion of Germany or southern portion of what is today Germany. And so what happened next is they said, you know what? We, Otto von Bismarck said that, we need to go to war with France. Um, and we need to create uh, a feeling of unity amongst all Germans. And so here's what he did. So um, in 1870, uh, Ger uh, Kaiser William was visiting, was on vacation in this place called Ems. And he was approached by the French ambassador. And the French ambassador um, long story short, basically um, said that he didn't want William's cousin to become king of Spain because that would put France in a bad position because to the west they would have a Hohenzollern or the same family and to the east they would also have them. And they didn't want to be surrounded by Germans and that really bothered him. Um, and so they didn't like that. Well, so <clears throat> William sent a telegram to Bismarck basically telling him what was going on and that was all it was, was them telling him what was going on. Well, Bismarck twisted the telegram and published it in the newspapers in Berlin to basically make it look like the French were telling the Germans what to do. And nobody tells the Germans or the Prussians what to do. And because they published this, the French actually wound up and got mad and declared war on them. Well, that war didn't go so well against them either. If France goes to war against Germany, it typically in the long run doesn't work out well. And the Prussians crushed them in the Franco-Prussian War. And so with their defeat on January 18, 1871, um, a constitutional monarchy was formed. <clears throat> in the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles, the Palace of Versailles in Paris, which had been captured by the Prussians, at the Hall of Mirrors, a, the German Empire was officially formed. And these southern states right here all joined with Prussia, and they formally named themselves the German Empire. At the head of this, Again, the government of Germany was a constitutional monarchy with William I being the monarch and Bismarck was his head of government. So Bismarck stayed in power in 1871. William stays in power in 1871. But instead of just ruling Prussia, now he rules all over what's called the German Empire. And last but not least, now 
Bismarck's got to go about uniting all the people. Now, they are very different. Even though they speak basically the same language, um, he's got to go about uniting these people that had never been united throughout history. Okay, only one other time during the Holy Roman Empire had they actually been united. And even then, they weren't very tightly united. And so Bismarck had to go through the difficult task of unifying these people who are similar culturally, but now had to go through and fully solidify them and get them to buy into the idea of a nation. And we'll talk about that a little bit tomorrow. Bye-bye.